Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Alan Hearn. I'm director of the Whitaker Institute here at NUI Galway. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today to this distinguished lecture organized by the Whitaker Institute and the Conflict, Humanitarianism and Security Cluster at the Institute, and to have the chance to introduce our guest speaker, Eamon Gilmore. The format this evening is that after Eamon's lecture, I will invite two respondents, Neela Dohertig and Anita Ferrara, to respond to the lecture, and I will then invite questions from your good selves, the audience. The theme of today's lecture is Europe's role in peacemaking, and Eamon Gilmore is someone with deep knowledge and extensive practical experience in this area. Eamon has served as EU Special Envoy for the Peace Process in Colombia since late 2015. In that role, he has spearheaded the EU support for Colombia's efforts to build a lasting peace in that country. Before that, as Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade from 2011 until July 2014, he was deeply involved in the Northern Ireland peace process. At the same time, of course, he served as Tornishta, and it was really great to hear Enda Kenny last month when he came here to, uh, to the university single out the courage of Eamon and his colleagues uh, in the Labour Party in making hard decisions, those very hard decisions uh, over those years that put the country, uh, this country on the, the path to economic recovery. Eamon was leader of the Labour Party from 2007 to 2014 and represented the constituency of Dunira uh, in Dáil Éireann for 27 years. Eamon is a graduate of, of NUIG uh, and he was conferred with an honorary doctorate by this university in 2016. So would you please join me in welcoming Eamon Gilmore to the podium. Uh, thank you very much, Alan, for your warm introduction. Uh, and thank you, Neil, for uh, inviting me and thank the Whitaker Institute for um, uh, inviting me to speak here at my alma mater on the role of the European Union as a peacemaker. Um, Dr. T.K. Whittaker, uh, who departed from us at the beginning of this year, uh, was one of my heroes. Uh, in my book, uh, Leading Lights, which uh, I wrote about people who had inspired me throughout my life, uh, I included a chapter uh, on Dr. Whitaker. And I recall uh, a cold November evening, uh, to this day almost, uh, seven years ago, uh, when to my surprise, uh, Dr. Whitaker turned up to the launch of the book. Uh, it was an honour and a tribute that I will never forget from a great Irish patriot uh, of whom his biographer Anne Chambers says, his was the quiet presence, the rational and informed voice behind many of the most momentous episodes in recent history. And one of those episodes was undoubtedly Ireland's decision in the early 1960s to seek membership of the European Economic Community a move which was greatly influenced by Whitaker himself. I'm also privileged to be here with you this evening in this prestigious venue, the Aula Maxima, where I once studied, or at least pretended to study, uh, where I did some of my exams and even uh, represented the Lytton Deb in an intervarsity debate from this very spot. This great hall in this unique quadrangle represents the continuity of this university, linking today's uh, 21st century NUIG campus with the Queen's College Galway of the mid-1800s. Generations of students and staff have sensed here, in this very place, the same atmosphere that we do here this evening. And this evening, I think in particular of students sitting their exams here in the Ala Maxima in the summer of 1914, maybe looking around at those very columns to try and recall a definition or a date or a poem. Um, and everything seemed normal then. The world was a peaceful place in the summer of 1914. But by the time those same students and the professors who collected their papers and who corrected them had returned to college here in the autumn, 
Europe was already knee-deep in the bloodiest war it had ever known. The historian Margaret Macmillan wrote of that time, and I quote, the coming of war took most Europeans by surprise, and their initial reaction was disbelief and shock. They had grown used to peace. The century since the end of the Napoleonic Wars had been the most peaceful one Europe had known since the Roman Empire. By the time that war ended four years later, nine million combatants, 50,000 of them Irish, had been killed. Another 15 million were injured, and seven million civilians were killed. Far from being the war to end all wars, the First World War helped create the conditions for the second and even more brutal World War, in which 60 million people, 3% of the then world population, were killed, and the nature of warfare itself was changed from battles between combatants to the mass deliberate slaughter of unarmed, defenseless civilians in the gas chambers of the Holocaust and beneath the deliberate bombings of cities such as Coventry, Dresden, Nagasaki, and Hiroshima. At no other time in history, and in no other continent on earth, has there ever been such an industrial scale of killing by humans of each other as occurred in Europe and was caused by Europeans in the first half of the 20th century. The century in which most of us were born and through which our parents and grandparents lived. It is that recent. It is hardly surprising then that the, at the end of the Second World War, there was a determination that it should never be permitted to happen again, which led to the development of multilateral rules-based systems for the prevention and resolution of disputes between states, including the establishment of the United Nations. On May the 9th, 1950, and mindful that France and Germany had been at war with each other three times in the previous 70 years, the Foreign Minister of France, Robert Schuman, made a proposal on behalf of the French government, quote, to place Franco-German production of coal and steel under one common high authority in an organization open to the participation of other countries of Europe. The proposal predicted that, quote, it will change the destiny of regions that have long been devoted to manufacturing munitions of war, of which they have been the most constantly the victims. And it asserted, this merging of our interests in coal and steel production and our joint action will make it plain that any war between France and Germany becomes not only unthinkable, but materially impossible. The Schumann Declaration, which is now celebrated every 9th of May as Europe Day, laid the foundation for what would become initially the European Coal and Steel Community in 1951, the European Economic Community in 1957, and eventually the European Union. Schumann called for a united Europe, quote, where the standard of living will rise by grouping together production and expanding markets. But he cautioned that Europe will not be made at once or according to a single master plan of construction. But the purpose was clear, to prevent the recurrence of war, to secure the peace in Europe, and to contribute to world peace. When we think of the European Union today, we think, I think, perhaps of the single market, biggest in the world, the customs union, the euro, banking union maybe, common policies on agriculture, fisheries, or here in the context of a university on research and innovation. Much of our laws on equality, environment, food and product regulation, and much more are transposed from shared European legislation. <coughs> the EU's principles on democracy, human rights, and rule of law reflect our own national aspirations. Whatever way we may think of the European Union, which we have helped to develop, and these are not always positive thoughts all of the time, we rarely think of its primary purpose as a peace process. In fact, most Europeans know very little about its work in the making of peace, in Europe itself, in our neighborhood, and in the wider world. This was one of the reasons why in 2012, when the EU was, quote, undergoing grave economic difficulties and considerable social unrest, 
it was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. Announcing the award, the Norwegian Nobel Committee said it wished, quote, to focus on what it sees as the EU's most important result, the successful struggle for peace and reconciliation and for democracy and human rights. The stabilizing part played by the EU has helped to transform most of Europe from a continent of war to a continent of peace. The countries which waged war on each other in the early 20th century now work together as member states of the European Union. Over six decades since the Treaty of Rome, the Union has expanded its membership to embrace countries which had once endured fascist and communist dictatorships and countries which had suffered vicious civil wars such as Spain and Greece. War between member states of the European Union is now unthinkable. The EU has helped to heal the wounds of the conflict in the Balkans. Slovenia and Croatia are now member states of the EU. The EU brokered a dialogue between Serbia and Kosovo and has opened up paths to EU membership for all of the Balkan countries which are at various stages of progress. Peacemaking by the EU is not confined by its own borders. Peace is a cornerstone of the Union's common foreign and security policies and actions. Article 21 of the Treaty of Lisbon, which deals with the EU's role on the international scene, commits the Union to define and pursue common policies and actions, quote, in order to preserve peace, pre prevent conflicts, and strengthen international security. The building of peace in the world is a core principle of the European Union, and one of the main reasons for which the EU's external policies are designed and for which the Union's European External Action Service was established. In June 2016, the EU adopted a new global strategy which sets out the Union's comprehensive approach to international peace and security, democracy, rule of law and the protection of human rights. As the High Representative and Vice President of the Union, Federica Mogherini, said, there is no peace without human rights there is no security without democracy. This is at the core of the European project, what she calls the European way, to help create more open, secure, and resilient societies where rights are respected, institutions are trusted, democracy is strong, and processes are transparent. These are the very principles which underpin the criteria for membership of the Union itself. In addition to a functioning market economy, Countries wishing to join the EU must have stable institutions guaranteeing democracy, the rule of law, human rights and respect for and protection of minorities. The Union's trade policies and its trade agreements are not confined to economic considerations, but also address issues such as child labour and forced labour, environmental destruction and price volatility, all of which constitute a threat to human rights and could cause a prolonged conflict. In line with this comprehensive approach, the European Union has led and supported peace talks around the world. For example, in July 2015, following years of EU-led diplomacy, a historic international agreement was reached on Iran's nuclear programme. The EU, together with China, France, Germany, the UK and the US, brokered the agreement. Iran pledged that under no circumstances would it ever seek, develop or acquire nuclear weapons. The EU now chairs the committee overseeing the implementation of this agreement. In Mali, the EU has been helping the country emerge from a profound political crisis through a co-mediated Malian peace agreement which was signed in June 2015. The EU is also helping to train the Malian armed forces to fight terrorism and through a substantial development aid. The European Union is the biggest contributor to development aid in the world. The EU and its member states currently provide over half of all the world's development assistance. The EU is the biggest contributor to humanitarian assistance in Syria, where it is also deploying its diplomatic resources to find a sustainable political solution. At present, the European Union has a total of 4,265 personnel deployed in 17 peace operations in different parts of the world comprising 3,119 military, 437 police, and 709 civilians. Among these uh, operations uh, is Operation SOFIA, the EU naval force 
in which the Irish Navy is playing an heroic role in saving the lives of refugees in the Mediterranean. Another naval operation is Operation Atalanta, the EU naval operation against piracy off the coast of Somalia. The 17 EU operations include training for military and police, capacity building for civil authorities and border support. The operations are across many countries, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, Palestine, Libya, Mali and Sahel, Niger, Central African Republic and Somalia. The EU's foreign policy instruments include the instrument contributing to stability and peace, the ICSP, which is designed to respond quickly and flexibly to conflicts and crises, providing short and mid-term assistance on conflict prevention, crisis response and peace building actions. It has a budget of 2.3 billion euros for the period 2014 to 2020. There are currently 200 ICSP projects in 75 countries. In addition, there are ICSP actions which are linked to global and transregional threats, and these are managed by DG Devco. Support for mediation, negotiation, and reconciliation processes at local, regional, and international level is also provided by the European Union. These include support for formal, informal, and grassroots initiatives in countries such as Syria, Libya, and Colombia, and capacity building to third parties involved in peace building, and the Philippines is an example of that. Furthermore, through the Hermes II project, the EU can deploy experts or provide logistical support at short notice to facilitate peace processes worldwide. Currently, there are 31 such projects operating in 19 countries. The EU also supports UN engagement in mediation and dialogue by funding the UN standby team of mediation experts and working with the UN to build national conflict prevention capacities in a number of countries. <laughs> Colombia is a good example of the comprehensive and integrated way that the European Union supports a peace process, drawing together the political, diplomatic, trade, development and humanitarian tools and using effectively the EU peace building instruments to which I have already referred. Colombia is a country which is the size of France and Spain combined, with a population of 48 million people. It is one of the world's longest standing constitutional democracies, it's been a democracy continuously since the second decade of the 19th century, with just one interruption for a period of four years in the 1950s. But it has been plagued through the decades by episodes of violence. The most recent was the guerrilla conflict which commenced in 1964 and was conducted mainly by FARC, but also by other guerrilla movements such as the ELN, EPL and M19, as well as by various paramilitary groups which emerged through the years. This was the bloodiest conflict in the Western Hemisphere since the American Civil War. Over the 53 years of the FARC conflict, 220,000 people were killed. Six million people were forced from their homes. 40,000 people are missing at the end of the conflict. And the only country in the world today which has more landmines than Colombia is Afghanistan, and the only country that has more internally displaced people is Syria. Over the years, there were many efforts by successive Colombian governments to bring the conflict to an end. In 2012, the Colombian government, led by President Juan Manuel Santos, began formal peace negotiations with FARC. The talks took place in Havana, <laughs> Cuba, and concluded in August 2016 with a comprehensive peace agreement. The agreement was defeated in a plebiscite by a very small margin in October last year but it was subsequently renegotiated and then approved by the Colombian Parliament. It has since then survived a succession of court challenges and is now being implemented. The disarmament of FARC has been completed. I was present in Mesetas when the final weapons were handed over to the United Nations last June. The arms dumps have been put under the control initially of the UN and now of the government, and there were about 900 of those. FARC has transitioned to a political party. 
The second main guerrilla movement, the ELN, are in negotiations with the government. Those negotiations are taking place in Quito and Ecuador. And they announced with the government a ceasefire during the recent visit by Pope Francis in September. For more than 30 years, the European Union has been supporting efforts to secure peace in Colombia. Even before the commencement of the formal peace talks between the government and FARC, the EU was supporting and financing projects such as the Peace Laboratories, which ran for 10 years between 2002 and 2012 in 614 municipalities and which were aimed at mitigating the causes of the conflict. The EU strongly supported the talks process and as the talks progressed, the EU deepened that support through the appointment of a special envoy for the peace process in Colombia and the establishment of an EU trust fund to support implementation. High Representative Federica Mogherini appointed me as her special envoy just over two years ago and last year she described the EU's involvement in the following terms, I quote, the European Union has worked with President Santos hand in hand since the very beginning of this process. Every single week, I would say, we were in contact at different levels to see how the European Union could practically accompany the negotiations, make sure that the peace agreement could be done and implemented in a successful way, providing the political support, the logistical support, the funding support in most cases, but also the diplomatic atmosphere around it. One example of the EU's financial support during the talks process was our funding for the pilot schemes on humanitarian demining, in which FARC commanders worked jointly with Colombian army officers to identify lands that had been contaminated by landmines, to map as far as could be recalled where landmines had been planted, and then to work on the dangerous task of physically removing them from the ground. The peace agreement of 2016 between the government of Colombia and FARC is arguably the most comprehensive and detailed peace accord anywhere in the world so far in this 21st century. It is over 300 pages long and is divided into six chapters reflecting the main items on the agenda agreed for the Havana talks. Integrated rural development, political participation, the end of the conflict including, including the laying down of arms and the reincorporation of former FARC combatants, solutions to the problems of illegal drugs, a very large chapter on the rights of victims, a system of truth, justice, reparation and non-repetition, a special jurisdiction for peace and human rights provisions and then implementation, including roles for the international community. Each part of the international community has been allocated what are called accompanying roles under the terms of the agreement. The United Nations was asked initially to oversee the disarmament phase for which they assembled a 500-member international monitoring mission, mostly from Latin American countries, but with some significant participation from some EU member states. The United Nations, too, on foot of Security Council resolutions, has now commenced a second three-year mission to work on overseeing the overall implementation of the agreement. The European Union was asked to accompany the implementation of three elements of the agreement. The chapter on comprehensive rural development, the reincorporation of FARC, and the establishment of a special investigation unit in the prosecutor's office. The EU Trust Fund which is financed by the European Commission and by contributions from 19 of the member states, including Ireland, will be used mainly to support rural development projects in four of the departments or provinces which were worst affected by the conflict. Following a, rec a recent decision board of the fund, monies may also now be used for the reincorporation of FARC and issues relating to the Special Investigation Unit are still under discussion between FARC and the government. All told, the European Union is making available almost 600 million euros, which includes loan finance from the European Investment Bank to support the implementation of the Colombian Peace Agreement. This is in addition to the considerable support which is being provided bilaterally by individual member states, including Ireland. To manage this support, the staffing of the EU delegation in Bogota has been increased 
and I travel to the country every six weeks or so to meet with government, political parties, civil society organisations, to consult with the ambassadors of the EU member states and to coordinate with other international bodies, especially with the United Nations. I also travel to the areas which have been affected by the conflict and which we hope will benefit from our projects, where I meet with local communities and with the victims of the conflict. I travel there again next Saturday. Progress is being made, but as we know very well from our own experience of a peace process on this island, the implementation can be even more difficult than the negotiation of the agreement in the first place. There are significant challenges in Colombia, including the slow pace of legislating for some key provisions of the agreement, some delays in the implementation on the ground, and most seriously, continuing violence, including the killing of social leaders and human rights defenders, most of this violence being associated with the illegal drugs trade. Since the beginning of this year, over 100 social leaders uh, and human rights defenders uh, have been killed, mostly uh, by paramilitary groups and armed groups associated with the illegal economy. In the face of these challenges, the message which I always bring from our experience of, Northern, of the Northern Ireland peace process is the importance of persistence when things go wrong. And I recall in particular the resilience and the reconciliation which was called upon following the OMA bombing in 1998, just five months after the Good Friday Agreement was signed. We also know the extent to which the Northern Ireland peace process relied on international support, especially at such difficult moments. The invaluable support of the United States, especially of President Clinton, and the extraordinary work of Senator George Mitchell and others is well known. Perhaps not so well publicized was the huge role which the European Union played in supporting peace in Northern Ireland. The biggest international supporter of the Northern Ireland peace process by far was the European Union. The European Union began funding peace projects in Northern Ireland as far back as 1989, almost a decade before the Good Friday Agreement. Since 1995, the European Union has provided 1.3 billion euros in dedicated peace funds. The fourth round of such EU peace funds was provided for in the multi-annual financial framework during Ireland's EU presidency in 2013. These funds now amount to a further 270 million euros. Mr. Pat Colgan, the former chief executive of the SEUPB, the body responsible for the administration of those funds in Northern Ireland, is now working with the Ministry of Post-Conflict in Bogota, making available in a very direct way the Northern Ireland experience of post-conflict peace projects. He also represents Ireland on the operational board of the EU Trust Fund. The importance of the EU to peace in Northern Ireland was, however, not confined to the financial. Ireland and the UK both joined the EEC in 1973 at an early stage of the Troubles. Accession was within a year of Bloody Sunday and the burning down of the British Embassy in Dublin. Relations between the two states were very bad, to put it mildly. Working together on EU councils and fora, Irish and British ministers and Irish and British officials developed a rapport and a level of cooperation on a range of common market issues which helped develop an improved atmosphere for discussion about Northern Ireland. By the time of the storm and talks in the mid to late 90s, both states shared a body of common European legislation, regulation and practice which facilitated the north, south and east, west dimensions of the agreements reached and of the institutions which were established. The Northern Ireland peace agreements were made on the assumption that both countries would remain in the EU. Indeed, it was never contemplated at that stage that either would leave. Brexit, and certainly the extreme form of it, now being pursued by the UK, has therefore implications for the Northern Ireland peace agreements which are deeper than the obviously important possibility of a hard border. 
The UK's decision to leave the EU ruptures the reality and assumption of common membership of the EU, which underpinned the Good Friday Agreement, an agreement which, let us not forget, was not just about Northern Ireland, but about the totality of the relationships between Britain and Ireland. Departure from the single market and the customs union is simply not compatible with the UK's obligations under the Good Friday Agreement. In Colombia and elsewhere, I'm often asked to draw parallels between the two processes. They are different in many ways, but the Northern Ireland experience to date has acted as an encouragement and inspiration to those who are working for peace in Colombia. President Santos, on receiving his Nobel Prize last year, told the ceremony in Oslo that he was inspired by the Northern Ireland peace process. Together, the two processes have the potential to inspire peace building elsewhere in the world and to provide a repository of good practice and lessons learned for the ending and preventing of other conflicts. In particular, the European Union can draw on the experience of its own support for both processes as it increases its own role as a major global actor. The peacemaking and peace-promoting purpose of the European Union is needed <coughs> now more than ever. 1.6 billion people, 22% of the world's population, live today in fragile or conflict-affected states. More than 94,000 people have been killed so far this year in the 40 armed conflicts which are taking place around the world. That is an average of more than 300 every day so far this year. Let us think of the worst year of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. It was 1972. It was the year I started college here in UCG. 497 people were killed in the Northern Ireland conflict that year. And if we take that as a benchmark, there are 20 conflicts around the world where more than that number have been killed already in 2017. And in some of these conflicts, such as Syria, the numbers killed are far, far greater. On top of that, there are 20 or so conflicts with killings continuing at a lower level. And then there are the so-called frozen conflicts, such as Transnistria and Nagorno-Karabakh. And there are tensions in many parts of the world which have the potential to flare into violence. The world today is a far more violent and war-prone place than the world was in the summer of 1914. Ending today's wars, securing ceasefires, negotiating peace agreements, settling disputes, preventing conflict, making peace, these are the urgent tasks of our times. To save lives, to avoid the physical and mental suffering caused by violence, and to prevent the world slipping into the abyss of war as happened on this small continent in the first half of the 20th century. The United Nations continues to do extraordinary work for peace with active Irish support and participation. But it is challenged by its own structures, which owe more to the post-World War II settlements than to, than to the realities and the needs of this 21st century. And it is being continually undermined and underfunded by some of its biggest and most powerful members. As in 1914, the world today has loud, bellicose voices preaching fire and fury, rather than reason, dialogue, and peace. In making the case for the EU's global strategy, Federica Mogherini spoke repeatedly on this theme. I quote from her, many are tempted in these tough times to seek unilateral action and shortcuts. Everyone wants to show their strength instead of showing their wisdom. Many believe that tough times as ours require tough men, strong men. It is always men. And by being strong means acting alone, being tough, being hard. I think you can be soft and strong at the same time. You do not necessarily need to be confrontational or tough to be strong. You can be strong with a smile. This very day, that philosophy is being expressed in Bangladesh, where she is um, 
uh, with uh, Rohingya refugees, where the European Union is already committing 51 million euros to support those refugees. Again, more than half of the total amount which was pledged in Geneva at a co-EU, co-chaired uh, event uh, in October, and where she has been working uh, with both the Prime Minister uh, of Bangladesh uh, and with Aung San Suu Kyi to try and find a peaceful political solution uh, to the Rohingya crisis. In the world today, the strongest voice sometimes expressed softly for peace and cooperation and in support of the UN is the European Union. More than ever, the world needs the EU as a peacemaker, as a consistent and reliable power. Peace was the EU's founding purpose. Now it is the biggest and best contribution which it can make to the modern world. It is a European role for which Ireland is uniquely prepared and experienced. Ireland's contribution to peace comes not just from our own tragic suffering, but from the role we have performed in humanitarian and development assistance, the record of missionaries and volunteers and Irish NGOs in helping some of the world's poorest peoples, the noble service of our defence forces in the peace work of the United Nations, the OSCE and the EU itself, the leadership of Ireland on the global agenda of nuclear non-proliferation and the sustainable development goals, and on our consistent values-based foreign policy. I believe that Dr T.K. Whitaker would have welcomed that role for both the EU and Ireland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raymond, for a truly wonderful lecture, um, really in insightful, uh, tour, uh, a real tour de force. Um, I thought the parallel you drew between today and 1914 was profound and, uh, and, a bit, and, and uh, really excellent insights, particularly with the, the lessons for Colombia from the experience in Northern Ireland, as you put it yourself, the importance of persistence when, when things go wrong. We have two respondents today. Our first respondent is Neil O'Darda. Neil is a senior lecturer in the School of Political Science and Sociology here at the university and leads the conflict humanitarianism and security cluster at the Whitaker Institute. He has published extensively uh, on the Northern Ireland conflict and on mediation and peace negotiations. Neil. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to briefly say thank you to Eamon Gilmore very much for coming to Galway and, and telling us a little bit about his experience of the Colombian peace process as well as his reflections on the EU. And I, th I hope that in question time as well, you'll have an opportunity to draw out more um, of the very kind of direct engagement he's, he's had with that process. Um, I found it particularly valuable that Eamon located the EU involvement in these peace processes within two broader contexts. And the first of them is the EU as a kind of peace project itself. So I think that's a very useful way to think of it and to think of its involvement in supporting peace settlements and compromise and a transition from violent confrontation to peaceful contention as very closely aligned with the EU's core function that we, we lose sight of when we think of it only as an economic alliance and an, an economic uh, club. And the second context is the EU in the current geopolitical context, one in which values around human rights and democracy and compromise are threatened by a kind of increasingly belligerent and authoritarian tone in public discourse. And I think that's it's important to, um, to locate its involvement in peace processes within that context as well. And a context in which the United States has moved from being supportive of the Colombian process to maybe not having quite as, you know, being, being quite as enthusiastically involved. Um, I just want to draw out two points and kind of amplify a couple of things that Eamon mentioned and then conclude by talking a little bit about one Galway connection to the both of these peace processes that kind of ties them together in a very direct way. Uh, the first is this transition from violent confrontation to peaceful politics so that peace settlements 
are not about an end to contest, they're not about an end to disagreement and conflict, they're about transformation from an arena of armed violence into one of electoral competition and peaceful conflict, if you like. So it's about a change in methods and modes rather than about universal agreement. And so in the Colombian, this was very important in the Irish context. It's, it's quite clear to us that a central way in which the settlement was bedded down was the successful incorporation of parties associated with paramilitary organizations in the political mainstream and the institutionalization of their role. Um, and this is also something at the heart of the Colombian peace process. And I want to just quote a statement a week ago by UN Under Secretary General Jeffrey Feltman on a visit to Colombia where he sought to support the process in the face of what seemed like threats to the idea of incorporating FARC and FARC's leaders in the political process. And Feltman said on his visit, he said, the decision by insurgents to forego armed violence in order to pursue peaceful democratic politics is at the very heart of the matter. It is the deal. So I thought that was a really interesting statement that actually at the core of all this is a transformation of, of political forces that use violence into forces that are incorporated into peaceful political competition. The second point uh, that I'd like to amplify a little is the EU role in the Northern Ireland peace process. It's on my mind because uh, a very, uh, an excellent PhD student of mine, Jada Lagana, has just finished her PhD process or PhD on the EU involvement in the, in the Northern Ireland peace process. And it provides lots of very, very rich new evidence of just how deep and strong this involvement was and much stronger than we're used to generally thinking. So it, it goes deeper and, as, as Eamon said, um, accordingly, the consequences of Britain's departure from the EU are much more serious for the settlement in Ireland, for the peace process in the North and for the institutions than we perhaps thought at uh, when this first happened, but I think is becoming much more um, embedded in public consciousness now. Um, finally, I want to just draw your attention to this strange kind of subterranean link between the Colombian and Northern Ireland peace processes, and there are lots of very direct public links. Um, as Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, the late Martin McGuinness visited Colombia in 2014 to support the peace process there. When he came back, he said he was absolutely amazed at the detailed knowledge that the Colombian negotiators had of back-channel communication in the Northern Ireland process. He said they knew all of the people involved, the MI6 agents, the intermediary, the people on the Republican side, they had very fine-grained detail of it. Not only that, they had codenamed their back channel with FARC, Brendan, after the Derry businessman who acted as intermediary between the IRA and the British government. Um, and the chief Colombian negotiators had directly consulted with MI6 agents who had worked with this intermediary. So this intermediary, Brendan Doddy, who died earlier this year, left his papers to Galway, his diaries of back channel communication and, and contact, uh, his experience of a back channel that directly influenced the way in which the Colombian government engaged secretly with FARC. So I think for that reason, this is an especially fitting venue to be talking about the connections between those two peace processes. I'll finish by thanking Eamon Gilmore once again and just wish him well on this role in the future when it, it seems there are still obstacles ahead um, and in which the EU seems to be playing an important and a positive role. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, our second respondent is Dr. Anita Ferrara. Anita is a lecturer at the Irish Centre for Human Rights here at the university, having previously worked for United Nations agencies and NGOs in the field of human rights. Anita. <coughs> Hi, good evening everybody, and uh, thanks again, Mr. Gilmore, for the fascinating and engaging talk uh, about the role of the EU as a global peace actor. 
I will actually add something on a couple of notes on the role of the EU exactly in the Colombian conflict in particular and on the peace building efforts that the EU supports as well as the transitional justice topic. Uh, primarily because I'm currently working on transitional justice and particularly on transitional justice in Latin American countries and of course on the Colombian peace process at the moment. Um, the EU supports peace processes worldwide, as Mr. Guillermo just said, through a multidimensional and integrated approach, which includes peace building initiatives, development cooperation projects, political negotiations at higher level, and mechanisms that support justice mechanisms. And um, I will briefly focus on due support on peace building in Colombia, and particularly on its support to transitional justice. Peace building has been the backbone of the European cooperation with Colombia since 2002. As Mr. Gilmour has already noted, the most significant EU projects in the area of peace building have been peace laboratories. And these have been local-led initiatives supported by the European Union between 2002 and 2012 to foster economic development and reconciliation in the rural communities mostly affected by the conflict. The EU sought in this way to address the root causes of conflict and foster reconciliation and peace building at grassroots level. These peace laboratories have been criticized by the scholarly works and are being assessed at the moment, but the main achievement uh, that have created has been giving support to processes that gave voice to civil society, to local actors, uh, to peace activists, to human rights activists, where the government was inexistent and where the dialogue between these groups and the local uh, institutions were basically inexistent. So this is a, a capital that uh, European Union projects have been able to build in terms of peace building. And while these peace building efforts have been uh, uh, extremely important, I think, I believe, special attention deserves the EU contribution to a transitional justice project worldwide, and specifically to Colombia, and I'm mentioning why. The EU, as a major peacemaker today, has the capability to demonstrate that peace does not necessarily come at the expense of justice and it's doing so by actively supporting transitional justice initiatives during peace negotiations while the negotiations are carried out, which is quite an innovative thing in the field of justice and in the field of transitional justice. Justice here is intended as a broad concept. It's not just, it goes beyond legal justice. We're not only talking about prosecutions. We're talking about restorative justice, reparative justice, and transformative justice. For those of you that are not familiar with this, transitional justice consists of a series of mechanisms, judicial and non-judicial mechanisms, such as prosecutions, truth commissions, reparations, memorialization initiatives, established to deal with massive and systematic human rights and humanitarian law violations committed during periods of conflicts or during a dictatorship. Although these mechanisms are today considered an integral part of the peace building agendas of post conflict reconstruction of countries, we know and we've learned that the challenges encountered in conflict and post conflict uh, settings are enormous. And the practice is very difficult, different, uh, the practice uh, uh, um, uh, from the theoretical understanding of that. Indeed, the EU has the potential to become one of the leading transitional justice actors in the world. The EU is already extremely active in financing many different transitional justice in many countries. It's one of the largest financial contribution in transitional justice initiatives. And in November 2015, has adopted its policy framework to support transitional justice. In doing so, the EU has underlined its commitment to support this process and has become the first regional organization to have a dedicated strategy towards transitional justice. The EU has stressed in this framework the importance of locally owned and a victim-centered approach to transitional justice, which ensure the, ensures the early involvement and participation of the victims in the uh, transitional justice processes since the beginning. And this is one of the most innovative aspects precisely of the Colombian transitional justice framework. The Colombian Peace Agreement in, it has a chapter, which is quite a long chapter, chapter five, Victims and Justice, which establishes a comprehensive system of truth, justice, and reparations, including a special jurisdiction for peace, which tries to strive a balance, a strike a balance between peace and justice, which prioritizes the victims as the main focus of the peace talks and includes land reforms 
and other reforms addressing inequality and poverty. Theoretically, the transitional justice framework in Colombia appears to be the best transitional justice deal to date ever reached during a peace agreement. It condenses the lessons learned from transitional justice during the last 35 years. Previous experiences, including Sierra Leone, Cambodia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Northern Ireland, were studied carefully by the Colombian process to avoid past mistakes and learn from best practices. In Colombia, the EU is largely involved providing logistical, political, and financial support to victim groups, human rights groups, to the coming national truth process. The international community is anxious to prove that it's possible to build an inclusive peace paradigm that addresses victims' rights in a comprehensive way and build sustainable peace based on truth and justice. Therefore, we hope, and I hope, that the EU will contribute to expand its support to the implementation of transitional justice process in Colombia, which could offer a sustainable model to follow in the future where peace and justice can be finally, maybe, reconciled. Thank you.